All right, excellent. So this will be a um, sort of a dive into a few tips. I have so much that I wanted to share, but I thought for the you know sake of time and focus, um, wanted to make sure that we leave you with something that you can remember at least to make sure your grant figures are beautiful next time. Um, and hopefully we will overcome some of those cringeworthy um, you know, design flaws that was just discussed in the, in the amazing panel just now. Um, I am using BioRender, but of course these tips are pretty universal. So no matter what tool you're using, um, you'll be able to apply these tips, but you know, shameless plug, I am going to be using BioRender and as well, we're going to be using the BioRender slides feature. I know this is relatively new, not many of you may have known about it yet, but you'll see that I can actually use BioRender as a multi, um, I guess, multi-figure uh, composing canvas in a sense. So along the right hand panel here, I'm going to be using BioRender to present about design tips within the slide feature. So it's a little bit uh, meta, but bear with me here. So um, this will be again, sort of a design focused webinar. I would say that, you know, generally, as you already heard some of the speakers um, talk about, you know, it's really about focus in your grant figure. So I believe that all the same design principles can sort of be applied to a messy room in a sense. Um, so, you know, any lack of focus of color, let's say there's too many things in the room, um, things in the wrong place, no sort of focal point. Um, I'm sure you can get that feeling of when you look at your figure or another person's figure that feels cluttered, almost, you know, kind of conjures up memories of, of a messy room. So uh, we'll apply some of those principles as we go through these tips here. And of course, you know, you can get, I guess, experimental or um, adventurous with color, but you have to use color very sparingly. So in this example, you know, these very bold sort of turquoise color options, um, you know, they're usable, you can incorporate it. And in fact, we encourage it, but again, very sparingly and um, be selective so that those are the areas that are going to draw your reviewer's eye to that part of your figure. So I hope that makes sense. When you're using color, use it very, very sparingly. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I'm getting a question here that you don't see half the screen. Are we looking okay still? Let me know if it's not. It looks good to me. It. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks for the heads up anyway. Um, and as a heads up, you know, I know Dr. Mirren did discuss this already, using sort of the overall end product. So, you know, whether it's a specific aims or a certain layout that you have to follow, making the figure is all well and good, but it has to translate within the overall design like this. So that usually means that once you're finished your figure, you know, I personally would shrink it down into sort of, uh, dummy text like this, so that you know that it'll register at whatever size um, the specs require it for. So, you know, you're making a figure on your large screen or a large monitor, um, but eventually it actually has to squeeze down to the size of a business card. So there's no point in, um, you know, making it so detailed if you actually won't register those details in its final form. So just keep that in mind. Um, I kind of screen grabbed Dr. Murin's image there. Um, so I hope that's okay, but I thought it was a fantastic example of um, the basic principles of, you know, very cohesive color palette. You notice that he used a different font here for um, the caption versus the font in the specific aims section here in the, in the main body text. So um, if you rewind the recording to um, Dr. Murin's talk, you'll see, um, you know, his explanation of his uh, layout here. But I wanted to call that out specifically as a great example. So for the next, say, 20 minutes, I know time flies by when we're having fun. Um, I'm going to focus on two, I guess, tips. Two things that I want you to sort of take away from this is to improve the reading order of your diagrams or figures, and also to be able to create focus in your figure with really, you know, a couple of uh, basic sub tips there. So your reading order and creating focus. And if you can do those two things to improve in your figure for your grant application, I think um, it'll really sing. So first thing is um, reading order, left to right, up to down or clockwise. I think, you know, this feels pretty self-explanatory, but it's something that we commonly see as a mistake in a lot of figures. So looking at figures, 
They should always read either left to right, up to down, maybe cyclical. If it's some sort of, um, you know, uh, cyclical process or repeatable process, I would say that for specific aims, whether it's two, three, or one aim, you know, as the argument was saying, it should still flow from left to right, up to down. You shouldn't get this sort of, you know, windy road to, to get the reviewer to sort of maze their way through your figure. It should be very simple. By the way, I'm using annotate as a plugin here on Google Chrome. Um, this is not part of the BioRender app, I'm just using it for presentation purposes. Um, okay. So that's reading order. You know, maybe you select one or two of these max when you're putting together your figure. And here's an example. We had a few brave uh, volunteers submit their grant figures to be reviewed uh, live like this, sort of a live office hours. Um, and what I like to do is start from the beginning to the end. If I were to sort of track my um, pupils or retina to see, you know, where am I looking when I approach a figure? Usually it's, you know, the top left. And in this case, I'm seeing arrows, which are going to sort of direct me to certain areas of my figure. Um, two arrows there. Now I'm seeing an arrow come back. So it's sending me back in this loop. Um, and there's something going on down here. I think they want me to end here. So if you look at sort of the, the path of least resistance, it's, it's, there's a pretty high friction here to get to the beginning and end of the story. Um, and this is a really good exercise to do on any figure. Just trace either your finger or maybe use a marker like this and see where your eye is led. And this is actually directly correlated to probably the, the um, um, you know, exhaustion that your reader will experience in trying to interpret your figure. So recreated, we actually just rotated the figure about 90 degrees and there's always a way to better lay out your figure. So in this case, we took the figure, flipped it on its side and um, repositioned a couple of the items here. So all the content is really the same, not a lot more to do. Really, it's just about the layout and again, the directionality of the reading order. So now we've got a nice waterfall happening top down. We do have some arrows pointing upward, but it's not as intense as previously where it was taking me all around the page. And generally speaking, it looks like this applicant or scientist wants me to read this figure from top down. And so that quick change made the reading order really clean and concise, keeps it focused. And again, doesn't tire out your reviewer because again, they're gonna be reading stacks of grants and they're not gonna to want to go back and try to interpret your figure if it's sort of taking you on a maze. So that's the reading order. This is another figure example. If your image that you're gonna be presenting or submitting is a little bit more cellular like this, again, be careful where you're placing numbers and arrows. If I were to trace you know, one to three to four, you're seeing that my eye is getting looped around to all different parts of the figure. If we were to re, jig this a little bit. And what we did was again, flipped it over sort of 90 degrees. And this took a little bit more puzzle piecing, but you know, in general, it's, there's always a way to re, uh, redesign content to be a little bit more smooth. So what we did was we put the story to start from the top left. That's usually a good place to start as the top left and then have your story flow in almost a cyclical pattern. And what we did was we created larger arrows we rejig the story so that you've got one, two, three, and four generally following a circle pattern. It's, again, not perfect, but it still has a bit of that cyclical flow that will allow your eye to more smoothly follow the story. And sometimes you'll have sort of smaller sub stories and that's okay, but maybe differentiate that with smaller arrows. So if I clear away my arrows here, you'll see that the biggest sort of gravitational pull is around the edges. And then we've got these smaller mid stories happening inside, which is again, okay. But if the you know thickness and weight of your arrow is the same all throughout, then your reviewers won't really know what is the main focus of your story. Okay, so that tip was covering again, the reading order. So left to right, up to down or clockwise. So be sure to follow that. Um, and then finally, to create focus in your figure, because a lot of the times people will come to us and say, my figure feels very cluttered and um, you know, I don't know what to remove or how to redesign it. Um, people tell me to leave void space, but I don't know how. Um, so here are some tips that you can sort of follow to create focus in your figure. 
color temperature, color saturation, transparencies, and being audience specific. So this will mean something to you, hopefully, as we go through each color temperature, pretty self-explanatory. What is temperature? It's hot, cold. Um, that's basically what colors can be attributed to. So if I were to take these objects, I'm just going to option drag and buy render. I can actually duplicate icons doing that as a shortcut. There's a, there's a rule of thumb in the design world where cool colors tend to be more uh, soothing to the eye. Sometimes protagonists of a story tend to be colored in blues, purples, or greens, especially in scientific figures. Um, and then warm colors tend to suggest antagonists of the story or sort of the bad guys or, you know, inflammation or blood, things that, um, you know, de denote um, negative uh, impacts in the body. So what I would suggest is to flip the script, flip the story. If you have a cancer cell that's cool in color, um, we're actually going to create um, a strange story here where that ends up looking like the protagonist. So it's pretty simple. What you want to do is make sure that all of your, um, I guess, lymphocytes in this case are a cooler color. Um, um, and then anything that's sort of the antagonist in the story, make sure that those are colored to be a little bit warmer. So you can see, oops, I think I highlighted as green by accident. You can see that right away, I'm getting um, sort of a register of the, you know, lymphocytes being the, um, the good guys in the story, and then the cancer cell being uh, sort of the invader. Whereas if the, these didn't have labels, you know, you kind of automatically assume the opposite. So really simple tip. Make sure to use warm and cool colors to your advantage. Um, and then in some cases where there's an autoimmune response or something like that, you might want to color the lymphocytes, um, you know, a, a sort of warm color to show that this is actually not what you want happening in the body and you want to reverse that, um, that process. All right. So that was color temperature. Now, color saturation is also something that you can play with, you know, turn the dial on to create focus in your figure. And um, here's an example of a, a very simplified sort of pathway diagram. Um, in this case, it kind of reminds me of a room that has, you know, yellow accent pillows and a red curtain um, and maybe like a blue bookshelf. But basically what happens is when you color everything a unique color, then, you know, nothing becomes important. So what I recommend is really dial back, almost wipe the slate clean of color and reintroduce color slowly. So here we go. Start from scratch. I've reduced the color. This is the exact same figure, by the way, nothing has changed except the color. Isn't that crazy? Such different registry of information. So I've removed the color. I've incorporated color in just the top part. So that's where my eye went right away. That's the highest saturation. Saturation is basically um, the brightest or boldest color versus unsaturated, unsaturated is you know going towards sort of grayscale or black and white. Um, so slowly start to reintroduce color to areas that are your focus. Is it the TGF beta? Is your focus these proteins on the left? Maybe your focus is more within the DNA, so um, or the nuclei rather. So you know depending on where you're focusing your story, that's where I would focus the saturation um, and even contrast but saturation is really, um, can, can be your best friend here if you, if you use the tool properly. Okay, so that's using color saturation to your advantage. And actually, you know, within BioRender, you can very easily change the color of these sort of text bubbles. If you are BioRender experts, you know that already, but we have these pre-made color palettes that make it really easy to select really any color under the rainbow. And then the font will actually change to the opposite value. So it'll be white on dark or black text on light background colors. So play around with that really neat feature. Okay. Um, and then another trick you can use within ViRender is to preview in grayscale. Not everybody knows about this tip, but I use it very, very often. I'd say if you walk into any professional design studio, everyone will have grayscale versions of their um, design design mocks because it's really important to make sure it's um, accessible, colorblind accessible, but also just generally accessible to even fully, um, you know, vision able folks because 
sometimes colors are deceiving. So in this case, you know, you can see clearly the red cells on top of this tube. Um, but these cells are getting lost. If I were to preview in grayscale, you can see that it very quickly tells me, yes, indeed it is disappearing. Um, so you might be thinking, okay, well, why don't I just make it a different color? So you go ahead and do that. Maybe make it an orange, go back to grayscale, still it disappears. And that's because um, it's still too similar of a color value. Basically the lightness or darkness is too similar to the background. So your foreground elements have to be distinct enough of a darkness, not just a different color, but a completely different lightness or darkness. So maybe I wanna pick a cell that is, let's see, you know, very bold blue or very bold, you know, red or orange. Basically, you know, if you wanna use orange, that's fine but you have to make sure that it's a different color value. So let's try that again. It's a little better, but you can see you can kind of toggle in black and white just to make sure that um, you have enough contrast in your figure. And this is gonna do a world of a difference when your reviewer comes to your figure and is actually able to register the information in it. Um, here's another classic example of nuclei of cells that stain dark. You know, everything that you layer on top of those nuclei are gonna actually disappear if it's very similar in color value. So let's do that trick again, where we're gonna preview in grayscale. Um, I know in the fine art world, we tend to squint, you know, you actually close one eye and, and squint to see if you can actually see the figure. Sometimes I'll even um, zoom out in my buyer render canvas like that. And if you can't see it at that scale, um, it probably means that your viewer is gonna miss it as well. So this is kind of a trick that I like to use. I'm actually rolling with my mouse wheel to zoom in and out. You can actually just use these to reset zoom or use the slider to zoom in and out. But this is a good trick to use. And actually, if your figure is gonna be pretty small in its end state, maybe a good idea to even zoom out just to see what it's gonna register as. So in this case, again, what do you think we could do here? Probably lighten the cell color, right? So that the foreground elements are more clear. So that went from we're looking quite dark to nice and contrasty, or this is a little bit trickier, but what you could do is make the foreground elements much lighter. Now, this is a little bit more tricky and um, you could get in trouble doing this, but sometimes it does work. See how I've made the DNA much lighter there. Still having issues with these orange molecules. So I would probably go back in and again, make those you know a stronger color um, against that background image. So that's previewing, previewing in grayscale to check for contrast issues. If there's one thing you take away from today's uh, design tips here, it would be that. So um, definitely keep that in mind. All right. Last few tips here is to look at transparencies and audience specific content. So I'm going to actually group those two together in the next examples here. Um, I like to show this example because this shows um, a lot of information. Um, but I suspect that your grant reviewers, you know, as, as much as a specialist as you are in your science, there's going to be things that are maybe canonical or universal that you don't really have to hit them over the head with. For example, you know, these are indeed lungs. I think everyone can agree on that. And that's pretty well established. Um, in this case, you can actually afford to reduce the transparency of them um, in favor of showing um, the trachea, the bronchioles, a little bit more clear. Um, because again, you don't have to shout at them that these are lungs. Um, same thing with the trachea, actually. You can probably reduce the transparency or rather increase the transparency, reduce the opacity. You see how the lymph nodes become so much more apparent when I uh, sort of slide the transparency up and down. And now right away, the nodes sort of stand out to me much more than before because audience specific, again, I don't have to teach them that there are trachea and lungs in the body. Um, they're suggested there just for anatomical placement, but again, you don't need to shout at them. Same with the liver. Um, I can't really see this metastasizing tumor because the liver is so dark. So what I would do is, um, you know, don't be afraid to play with the transparency slider. 
Another way to do this is to sort of have an outline of the organs, um, but I think in this case, this works pretty well. So that was really simple, right? Just kind of playing with the opacity of layering layered objects so that your uh, main story really stands out. And again, the focus is now the tumor, three centimeters through to five, five to seven, and over seven. I bet you that didn't really stand out before when the lungs were at full opacity, okay? So that was another quick tip there. I'm gonna quickly go through in the last five minutes, a couple of more examples that were volunteered bravely, and we'll see how the design tips that we just learned apply to making them better. Um, I loved this proposal, this figure, because it was very um, nicely sort of aligned text-wise. There was some use of color coordination. So anything related to regulator regulators of PRM T5 activity, I think were color coded in blue. And same thing with green. Um, one thing I, you know, our team did to sort of make over this figure was to again dial back the amount of colors being used. And so this was the after, this was the before. So a pretty subtle difference, but you can see that you know we didn't need to incorporate all those colors. Same with the background. You know, the nuclea nucleus didn't have to be purple. Um, thinking about audience specificity, they probably don't need to know that this is a phospholipid bilayer. I think generally speaking, you know, most reviewers will know that that is a cell membrane. So we opted for this sort of smoother, um, sort of double lined um, iconography, and that automatically cleaned, it up, cleaned up the composition a little bit. Not everything has to be in its own box all the time. I know we're tempted to box things in, um, but that actually can work against you. So we remove that box. And um, generally speaking, I think it flows a little bit better. Maybe I would sort of tweak and move things around just a little bit. But I think for the most part, the before and after looks quite nice. I don't know what you all think, but I think there's definitely an improvement there. Um, here's another example, a little bit more of, again, of a cellular um, process, but um, thinking about audience specificity. And it looks like my internet might be a little bit choppy. So again, uh, apologies there. But audience specificity, you know, this is, yes, indeed a cell with an outline and cytosol. But right now, again, if I squint, if I do the old the squint trick, right now I see pink, a bright orange membrane, and uh, a yellow interior with some stuff happening and this little green cell on the side. That's really standing out to me. Um, again, as a reviewer, I probably don't need to be shouted at that this is the edge of the cell. This could be really um, muted and have the inside, whatever is happening on the inside, um, be more um, of a focus. So that's what we did. This is the before, and this is the after. So you can see we really reduced, um, I guess, the uh, intensity of the cell outline. Uh, we also bumped up the size of the, um, the T helper cell here because um, scale-wise, I think it wasn't really um, accurate. Like we, can't, we can't be accurate all the time. I mean, these proteins aren't that large in real life, but to our best of our abilities, we like to keep it pretty one-to-one. -one. Um, and then really the focus ends up being what's happening on the inside of the, of the cell and also maybe the inputs and outputs of this process. So going from before and after, we reduce the number of colors. We really talked about, thought, thought about the specificity of the audience. You know, they don't need to know um, that intensely that, you know, this is the outline of the cell. We kind of, you know, reduce that, subdued that back and then saved the color splashes for the arrows and sort of these little vesicles. So you can see there the, the difference. And again, all the same content, it just takes a little bit of tweaking, maybe spend an hour, you know, rejigging and using some of these tips. And I um, suspect your figure will look much, much cleaner. Last few figures here. Here's another one that I thought was really nice. Very clear division of three sort of categories. Um, so we just clean it up a little bit, thinking about you know areas that we can improve as far as legibility. So I see sort of two processes here happening. We were able to condense those into one. So here's the before, here's the after, where it was um, you know one cell le leading to sort of two outcomes. I thought that was a cleaner approach. So again, there's a before, there's the after. We also incorporated these dotted lines just to give a little bit more of a segregation between these three um, uh, mechanisms or processes, instead of somebody accidentally assuming that they actually kind of all flow together, which could happen. 
Um, it actually does look like, you know, one is sort of related to the other. In fact, they were three different. So that's what we did. We sort of created a line in between the three um, and then calling out certain things that were a little bit lost in contrast. So again, using our grayscale checker, this little X over the um, ARID1A protein was not that visible. So if we called it out specifically, you can see here, it really looks striking that this does not bind here or there's no um, interaction that happens as a result. That's a lot more clear to me in this example than what's happening here. So grayscale again could be your best friend when checking for legibility. Okay, and then let's see here. We already talked about this example. So, you know, reducing the number of colors, uh, the directionality of legibility. And then finally, this is sort of a nice um, way to round out, you know, why I believe um, BioRender is so strong in helping create figures for you for your grant applications is sort of the uniformity of your figure. So I know I see a lot of figures or, um, you know, scientists will come to us and say, can you help me make my figure look more uniform? And I'm sure you've been in the situation where you have photographs mixed with, uh, you know, real data and graphs from say GraphPad Prism, you've pulled them in. Um, maybe you have, you know, icons in BioRender as one of your steps. And then you sort of have this like mishmash happening of different um, visualization, um, I guess, modes. So photographs, hand drawings, um, old graphical abstracts that you've chopped up and pulled in. So to avoid that, um, you know, I always like to try to keep things consistent by having everything look like one artist drew the whole thing. And for the most part, that's usually possible in BioRender. So um, here's the before and here's the after where we actually just use all the same, um, you know, vector type images. We were able to find this machine in BioRender. I think it's called 7100 capillary. There we go. So um, if you look through our icon library, you'll see that we've got a huge variety of really beautiful machinery. Um, these are all drawn in-house by our professional illustrators, and they're all vector-based. So no matter what objects you pull into the canvas, it's going to look like, you know, the same artist drew it, even though they're, you know, seemingly disparate concepts. So they all have that sort of really beautiful vectorized um, style. So as best as possible, like I said, um, try to keep the style consistent, especially if you have these sort of stepwise processes or experimental flows. Um, you don't want it to look like it was, you know, hodgepodge or uh, mixed in together, sort of a, a cut and paste of a bunch of sources. Okay, and I love this little tweet that we were called out on um, that, you know, review article or grant application independent of that, you know, generally speaking, writers will think I'll do the figures at the end and reviewers will say, I'll review the figures at the start. And naturally, you know, that's going to happen because if you come across something like this, our eyes are gonna naturally wanna focus on the easiest thing to read, which is usually the picture. So um, again, I, I highly recommend starting early. There are questions about when to start your figure. I would start it um, as early as possible and iterate and get feedback as you would um, your, your writing part of the grant.